But uh, no, I don't think I'm surprised at the speed. I, when, when when I was discussing this with some uh, Libyan people related, connected with the, the rebels last week, and, and I think they foresaw two possible scenarios. One would be a dreadful battle of Tripoli, uh, and the other was a quick, uh, the word they used is implosion. Very quickly, it's not quite over yet. I understand there's still a bit of fighting going on. There are pockets of resistance, and Gaddafi himself, of course, has not turned up yet. Uh, but we hope that the transition is smooth. Is there any doubt then that th this is the end of his 42-year regime? The end of the story? No. The end. Of, is there any doubt that this is the end of Colonel Gaddafi's rule over Libya? No, I don't think there is any serious doubt. Uh, I, I can't, for the life of me, see how even even that magician. Uh, that conjurer could, could play a, a, a last trick which would, would perpetuate his power. I, I strongly suspect uh, he will tr still try and do something unexpected, but I don't think it will be effective. Is there anyone, any country that you could see offering him asylum at this point? Oh yes, after all he's got an, an enormous quantity of gold. Uh, yes, I think certainly he could find asylum, most probably in Africa. The, the, question, the difficult part of it would be uh, that Presumably he would look for some kind of guarantee of security and it's not clear who could give him a guarantee of security because promises are one thing but implementation is another. There's been no opportunity for any form of opposition to gain the kind of political experience that they will need to run the country. So what are your concerns in the next few weeks about how the Transition Council should take over? What, sh what should they be wary of? Well, first of all, it's not quite true that nobody's had any experience because, after all, they have been running Benghazi and increasing uh, areas of, of Libya uh, for the best part of six months now. So uh, the, the people in the National Transitional Council have, to some extent, shown their quality, and I think it's been successful. There's been one shocking incident in, in Benghazi, the, the murder of the, the military commander, which hasn't yet been cleared up. Um, but apart from that, it was an isolated incident, and we don't know who, who was responsible. Apart from that, they've done well. The people in, in uh, Benghazi live in relative security. They have supplies of the essentials, food, water, electricity. Um, they are, for the moment, reasonably content. And don't forget that's against the background of the, the rebels being denied the money which belongs to Libya, which has been frozen by the United Nations. But it is against the backdrop of having support from NATO, which is going to need to continue, isn't it? Uh, yes, the, the support, uh, and everyone talks about NATO. It wasn't only NATO, don't forget, it was support from NATO and some Arab states. Uh, and the, 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 that support took two forms, I think. One was the, the military support, which negated Gaddafi's advantage in heavy weaponry, meant that his tanks and artillery were not the decisive uh, factor in the fighting, and that in the end undid him. And the other form of aid that's been given is uh, support for, the, for the, national, the Transitional National Council in Benghazi, support of many kinds. There have been teams of, of people there. I was told last week that uh, the, the National Transitional Council have had um, uh, advice from the United Nations on constitution building, admi advice from America on constitution building, advice from the UK on constitution building. So they've gone ahead and done their own paper on constitutional building, which is quite right, that's the way it should be. And they may need our help and they may ask for our help, but we're not going to be running the show. And I was delighted to hear from, from your extracts from the Prime Minister's statement that he seems to recognise that and uh, I, I think it would be a great mistake to imagine that uh, Libya's future now depends on NATO. How important and any welcome would it be for the many... Uh, well, I think a lot of them will return home and a lot of them will not return home and that's a Libyan problem again. It, it's um, uh, something I know which um, is difficult not only in Libya, it's difficult uh, in, in a great many countries. I know, happen to know the, the Middle East and the Arab world best but uh, the fact that so many of Libya's best doctors and surgeons for example are working in NHS, NHS hospitals in the UK is fine for us but not so good for Libya and Libya would like to attract them back. But in order to attract them back, of course, they will have to provide security and prosperity, and that won't be easy. Ambassador Oliver Miles, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, time now for the business news with Sam Washington.
Yes, Martin Peter, thank you very much. Oil prices fell on speculation that Colonel Gaddafi's 40-year rule in Libya is on the edge of collapse. Brent crude in London plunged more than 3% to just over 106 US dollars a barrel, while US sweet crude fell nearly 1% before regaining ground. Well, let's have a look at the current prices. There we are. That's as they stand at the moment. Now, Brent crude is the most important measure there for looking at the impact of Libya. That's because uh, European countries importing a lot of Libyan oil. They're light crude. That's the US measure. Less affected prices have now actually gone up there. Uh, gold, as we can see, um, obviously remaining unchanged until that price fix later today, but remaining in record high territory. Let's have a quick look at markets around the world. There we are. Uh, Asian markets, the only one to close up today was the Hang Seng in Hong Kong. That was lifted up by HSBC that did very well today. The rest of the uh, markets in Asia closing down. Uh, concerns about global econ economic factors there. And finally, a little bit closer to home, FTSE edging up uh, about 2%. Also, indices in Europe uh, also lifted up. Uh, some of that is down to energy companies. Well, joining me now to make some sense of all of this and what it means for the markets today and also going forward is Jeremy Stretch from CIBC. Hello, Jeremy. Um, some commentators are saying that what's happening in Libya could release another million barrels a day of oil onto the market. And, have we already seen that priced into those falls there, or what, might we see the price coming down further? Well, clearly, as uh, the oil markets have opened uh, over the, uh, the start of this week, we have seen uh, prices coming off, at least initially, as uh, markets reacted to the speed uh, of the events uh, over the weekend in Libya, and obviously hoping that that would bring forth uh, an earlier resolution to the lack of uh, oil supply supply out of Libya. Now, I would question as to how quickly that supply could come back on stream because, of course, we don't know how much of the infrastructure has been damaged and we also uh, would need to see some of those foreign workers going back in. But clearly, if we are going to see an improved news tone coming out of uh, Libya and perhaps a, a resumption of supply, then that would help to arrest one of the big negative headwinds that we've seen in the global economy because, of course, the spike in oil prices after the start of the Libyan uprising was one of the reasons why we've seen the global economic downswing over the course of the last few months. Yes, of course, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, how significant is Libya really? I mean, isn't it the macroeconomic global pressures, really, that are going to affect the price of oil and also markets around the world? Well, it is, it is a combination of those two factors because what we've seen over the course of the last month or two is that oil prices in general have been softening because of uh, the assumption that we were going to see slower global demand through the rest of this year and into 2012. So clearly on the demand side, we're, we're seeing less pressure on, on prices. But of course, going back, to, going back to the spring, when we did see the oil price uh, spike, that was one of the reasons why the, the global economy did decelerate. And so that's one of the catalysts for the, the slower level of, slower pace of growth. So I think the, the moderation of the prices, assumption that that may be, but the moderation of prices will reduce at least one of the headwinds from the global financial uh, environment. But clearly, we still have a number of those, not least because of pressures on, uh, on the banking sector. And of course, uh, the Eurozone's woes are uh, attributed to the oil price. Okay, Jeremy Svetch, thank you very much indeed. We'll have to thank leave you. it there. That's it from me. I'll be back in an hour with another update. Back over to you. Sam, thanks very much. Let's just get you right up to speed if you're just joining us here on BBC News with the very latest, as we understand it, coming to us out of the Libyan capital. It looks as if the rebels are carrying through on their very well expressed desire to take the city in its entirety. Conflicting reports as to how much territory inside Tripoli they actually control. The Chargé d'Affaires here in London saying it's 90 percent, some of the rebels saying it's more like 80 percent. Two interesting dynamics here. One, the speed with which this has happened just over the past 18 hours or so. And the second uh, dynamic as well, the way the rebels, when they went into the city in the early hours of Monday morning, were met by local people, armed residents of Tripoli, who found out somehow that the rebels were making their way into the capital. And this follows, of course, those important gains in those strategically uh, significant towns of Zawiya and Zlitan uh, just in the last few days. And it, all, it almost seemed unbelievable that they could try to take Tripoli so quickly after the fighting that um, no doubt took, out a, a, took a great deal of uh, effort in Zawiya and Zlitan, that they would have the resources, the arms and the, the, and the, and the troops available to, uh, to march on the capital. It was certainly 
quite a reversal of fortunes. Nobody knows at the moment where Colonel Gaddafi is. There are all sorts of um, appeals from world leaders that he should give up now to prevent any further bloodshed of his people. We've also heard from the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, who's uh, been hosting a, a, a meeting of the National Security Council in Downing Street in London today. He says that the Gaddafi regime is falling apart after 42 years. He says that fighting must stop without conditions. Of course, this is significant. Just to rewind a little bit, he was, or he is, I should say, the Arab world's longest ruling, longest ruling leader. Just weeks ago, he had appeared to have a firm grip on the Libyan capital, despite five and a half months then. It was five and a half months of NATO airstrike. For the rebels, the charge d'affaires in London saying the rebels want the NATO campaign to stop. NATO out of its strategic HQ in Naples and indeed out of Brussels saying no, the campaign goes on. They have a checklist of achievements that they want to get through. We also hear that two of Colonel Gaddafi's sons have been arrested. This is BBC News.